Dr. Carol Tripkoff is a professor in the Department of Pathology and Medicine in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Calgary, Calgary, Alberta. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and a consultant urological pathologist for the Southern Alberta Institute of Urology and the Tom Baker Cancer Center in Calgary, Canada. Uh, Dr. Tripkoff's interest uh, and expertise is in the area of urological pathology as well as kidney pathology and transplant pathology. Dr. Rivkoff has published uh, extensively in uh, art original articles, book chapters, and other scholarly contributions, and is very active in contributing to uh, educational programs at the national and international level. He received a number of uh, teaching awards, including uh, being featured as one of the great teachers at the University of Calgary. Last decade, Dr. Tripkoff has established, anato uh, established the anatomical pathology laboratory at the Rockview General Hospital in one of the largest centralized uropathology centers in Canada, North America. So this week setup provides an excellent clinical service for uropathology, but creates an ideal environment for teaching and research as well. So without any further ado, Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you, John, for that kind of introduction. And, um Welcome everybody to this session. I should say uh, good morning to everybody in the West and uh, still good afternoon uh, to everybody in the uh, uh, East. Um, I've uh, pulled out some numbers from 2012 to illustrate how busy place we are. We have uh, the area of Calgary in southern Alberta and uh, we're not a place that uh, only receives uh, genital urinary pathology specimens. We do get all sorts of uh, general surgical pathology specimens. Um, I have no financial relationships to this disclosure. I will not discuss any uh, label or investigational um, use uh, inventation. I have two objectives for this presentation. Number one is to review the Care, uh, checklist or the protocols for the examination of specimens from patients with carcinomas of renal, pelvis, and ureter, and to uh, discuss some issues uh, pertaining to the diagnosis, um, grading, and staging, as well as reporting and sampling. And we will do that as well for uh, the ureteral specimens. I would appreciate really if everybody online uh, mutes their microphones because I'm hearing some noise in the background. Thank you. Well, for examination of specimen from patients with carcinomas of the ureter and pelvis pertain to the invasive and the in-situ carcinomas, and, uh, all associated epithelial lesions of the ureter and renal pelvis, and these are available online, and you can download them and use them in your practice. In terms of the ureter and the, the renal pelvis, there are three separate um, uh, CAP uh, protocols or checklists. One pertains to the ureter, one pertains to the renal pelvis, uh, with um, uh, regard to the resection, nephroureterectomy, partial and complete uh, specimens, and one pertains to uh, the uh, To summarize what has changed in the last iteration of the capsules for the renal pelvis and ureter, um, this is the only thing that, that, that new. Um, uh, Previously, uh, the item of the original lymph nodes, you should specify the number examined and the number involved. And they've been changed to into a lengthy um, discussion which specifies what has been uh, performed. Uh, no notes submitted or found the number of uh, lymph nodes examined um, if uh, there is a reason why this can be determined, and as well the number of lymph nodes involved. Um, the ureter and the renal pelvis, um, uh, I should uh, warn you that the use of checklist is optional, but if one uses this checklist, it would essentially uh, be referred to all the elements that are necessary to be contained in a report. The specimen itself uh, can be either renal pelvis, ureter, or it can be something else, as well as the specimen laterality can be uh, uh, specified. Of the histologic type of the renal chair. Uh, as you can see, there is uh, availability of different uh, histologic types. And as well, one can uh, include in the report the associated epithelial lesions in addition to those that are main diagnostic finding. Uh, I say here that the relevant history is 
important for interpretation of all upper urinary tract uh, specimens in the history of renal zones, recent procedures, infections, obstructions can influence the interpretation of random biopsies obtained from patients with hematuria, which is the main uh, clinical presentation of these patients. Any plasms previously diagnosed should be specified, uh, including the histologic type, parasite, histologic grade. Pelvic tumors are more often uh, associated in patients who are analgesic abusers or often have analgesic uh, nephropathy, including popular in necrosis. If therapy has been given, it should be described uh, whether this is systemic or intravesical chemotherapy, etc. In terms of the type, I should uh, say that, that similar to the urinary bladder, the vast majority, more than 95% of carcinomas of the renal pelvis and ureter are filial in origin. In unusual histomorphology variants and types seem more common in the upper tract in carcinomas uh, such as micropapillary, lymphoepithelioma like somatoid, string plasmacytoid, etc. A distinction between urothelial carcinoma with aberrant or divergent squamous or glandular differentiation and a primary squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma can be difficult and sometimes arbitrary. However, most experts uh, would require a pure histology or almost pure histology of squamous carcinoma or adenocarcinoma to date a tumor as such. Uh, urothelial carcinomas of the renal pelvis and ureter are associated similar to those in the bladder with smoking, uh, fasted in exposures, as we've mentioned, and occupational exposures. Um, for instance, patients in uh, chemical, petrochemical, plastic industries, uh, exposure to coal, asphalt, tar, and uh, uh, other uh, chemical carcinogens. The history of previous urinary tract carcinoma is noted in about 80% of these patients in the presence of upper tract uh, tumor previously increases the risk for developing bladder cancer and goes from about 50% to about 75% over a five-year span, which obviously mandates ongoing routine bladder surveillance for these patients. The histological grade of the patient is the one that we used for the rest of the urothelial tract and for adenocarcinoma and squamous carcinoma, which the other two beams, we really classify them as well differentiated, moderately or poorly differentiated. Uh, Celiac carcinomas of the renal pelvis tend to be high uh, grade more frequently compared to urinary bladder carcinomas. This grade system, as I mentioned, is the same, and there has been some controversy uh, in the past. But we are referring to the WHO 2004 classification, which has simplified things. Uh, in general, I should say also that uh, endoscopic or ureteroscopic biopsies produce a, a significant negative rate. And it's due to, for instance, sampling and diagnostic errors. So a negative result on a biopsy should be accepted always with caution. Uh, particularly if there is limited or scant tissue. Uh, uh, and um, these biopsies are often difficult to interpret. We can't pretend that you know, this is an easy part of our job. Tube grading is accurate, particularly if larger tissue samples are available, uh, but the tumor staging tends to be quite unremarkable. In terms of the tumor configuration, one can, uh, possible one can specify whether uh, um, the configuration is papillary, solid, or not, or flat, or ulcerated. In particular, the equation of material uh, is to be clarified whether the muscular is propria was identified, present, or indeterminate. A uh, sample of a gross um, specimen of urothelial carcinoma, and often uh, this is relatively easy to recognize. On gross magnification, the tumor is either centered on the uh, renal pests, a renal parenchyma, or it extends into the minor calyces as shown on the picture to uh, the right. Illustrated urothelial carcinoma of the renal pelvis, which extends into the minor calyces and the ureteropelvic junction, and is quite an extensive uh, involvement which uh, involves the 
the superior pole of the uh, kidney. And also, please note the alteration and the neurotic changes in the adjacent uh, renal cortex. Urocarcinoma of the renal pelvis, and you can see the arrow pointing to a narrow uh, area of the ureteropelvic pelvic junction and renal pelvis often invades uh, in the peripelvic fat. And invasion can be seen into the renal parenchyma through the full thickness of the renal parenchyma and into the perirenal fat, which is illustrated in uh, the picture on the right. In urothelial carcinomas of the ureter, which are involving the mid portion of the ureter, and extending obstructive uh, of the ureter often results in hydronephrosis, which is um, moderate in its scope on the left and quite severe and pronounced on the right. High magnification shows you the papillary nature of the neoplasm. And on the right, uh, you can see the polypoid nature, the gross appearance of this tumor. I will stop here and give you a little bit of a background with a general approach uh, to arterial neoplasms. And this is not only relevant to occurring in the uh, renal pelvis and urethra, but throughout the uh, uh, urinary tract. It deals with your exophytic growth, which can be with or without initiation. You can have flat growth with or without invasion. And these two patterns of growth are well recognized in the WHO 2004. However, more recently, the literature recognizes, and most of the experts agree, that there is one pattern that we should all be familiar with, which is the inverted or endophytic growth. And similarly, as the other patterns of growth, it can demonstrate um, non-invasive or invasive growth. When you think about papillomyoplasm, you always uh, have the idea of, of the papillary stalk, which conveys or conjures the image of a neoplasm. These single-like projections were characterized by definite fibrovascular core. Even one definite fibrovascular core may be sufficient to establish a diagnosis of papillary neoplasm. And the lining of of the urothelium can be either normal or thick, and you've got the two elements that are necessary to establish diagnosis of papillary urothelial neoplasm. Other are those um, uh, papillary urothelial neoplasms that, that are typically lined by normal urothelium, and they should be rare in the practice. Pans or papillary urothelial neoplasms of low malignant potential are uh, characterized by thick urothelium demonstrating minimal or mild cytologic and architectural changes in poly of mitosis. Uh, the of mitosis should be restricted to the base. And one, if one sees lots of mitosis, this should pop up uh, the diagnosis to low-grade papillary arterial carcinoma, which is characterized with mild atypia, but more significant architectural cellular changes, which still um, convey uh, the image of order. In high grade urothelial carcinoma is characterized by more significant atypia and architectural and cellular disorder. And this is illustrated in the next panel where you can appreciate the, the, the architecture left in low grade urothelial carcinoma, significant nuclear pleomorphism, nuclear hyperchromaticity, regular nuclear uh, figures, and mitotic figures on the right. How it has to keep in mind always that uh, when one sees papillary neoplasm that doesn't or that uh, exhibits papillary features that does not necessarily mean that one deals with papillary neoplasm. For instance, here is a ureter lesion which is characterized by fibrostroma, or normal urothelium, but please that there is no fibrovascular core. This is obviously fibroepithelial polyp of ureter, which is a lesion which can uh, mimic papillary neoplasm. Uh, another example of something that can mimic papillary neoplasm is illustrated here, where you see pro a florid proliferative, uh, uh, depending on the location, cystitis, ureteritis, urethritis, composed of mobrun's nests and uh, dilated glands. Uh, the other mimic can be florid proliferative cystitis undergoing intestinal metaplasia, which is then characterized by the term glandular. Reotelial changes with both papillary protrusion, but please note again 
and velocity or the lack of fibrovascular cores should differentiate, for instance, polypocystitis or respective ureteritis and ureteritis from true uh, papillary lesion. On the right hand side, you've got an example of papillary cystitis, but this also can occur at the other location. Those are the papillary lesions. What about the flat urothelial lesions? I can start with the normal and hyperplastic changes, then reactive or inflammatory atypia, atypia of insignificance, and in terms of the progression, we are dealing at the high end of the spectrum with dysplastic lesions also known as a low-grade intraurothelial neoplasia or carcinoma in situ, high-grade intraurothelial neoplasia. Let me do this with a few pictures. With norurothelium, and we have learned that it's not important to count the number of layers because different sites, the number of layers is quite variable. What's important is the or the uniformity of the cells on architectural as well as on cytologic levels. They are nicely oriented, perpendicular, and you can see there is a little bit of atypia toward the surface, which stems from the presence of the umbrella cells. Plastic epithelium can be either completely flat or a little bit wavy, but again, note there is a lack of fibrovascular cores. High plastic urothelium is typically seen in the shoulders of papillary lesions, and uh, it's characterized by thickened, uh, obviously, at low or medium power magnification normal or all urothelium. Reactive urothelial atypia uh, is a change that uh, is often associated with local irritation and it is characterized by cells that are slightly larger than uh, normal urothelial cells with discrete nuclei. However, that there is a lack of chromaticity nuclear irregularity. A key that is helpful in the diagnostic practice is the sprinkling of inflammatory cells, which helps in this diagnosis. I also mentioned that uh, mitotic figures can be frequently seen in reactive um, uh, ATPL, ATP, and should not be construed as evidence of preneoplastic lesion. Here, are example of a more papillary urothelial ATP due to local irritation, and please note. And the ochromatin delicate nuclei in the urothelial cells and scattering inflammatory cells through the full thickness of the urothelium. Atypical significance is a category when one is un really uncertain whether it's dealing, uh, he's dealing with the preneoplastic lesion. And see here the cells look slightly enlarged, uh, well oriented, however, no aortic figures are present, there are scattered inflammatory cells, and one cannot simply rule out dysplasia. And this is a category that I relatively infrequently use in my practice. And usually accompany, I usually accompany my, my reports with a note that I cannot rule dysplasia and um, a caution that a uh, patient is followed. Dysplasia, in contrast, is characterized as a preneoplastic lesion, which falls short of carcinoma in situ. It is characterized by architectural and cytologic atypia. Note the irregular distribution of the nuclei, the irregular shapes of nuclei, and often mitotic figures can be seen typically there in the lower half of the urothelium. Carcinoma in situ is the severe uh, form of dysplastic uh, lesion. And note here uh, the enlargement of the nuclei on the left side of the urothelium, which of the normal membrane. When one sees normal urothelium, one can use this a reference point to judge whether there are dysplastic or carcinoma in situ type changes in adjacent urothelium. Here is an example of urothelial carcinoma in situ with severe dysplasia with preservation of the basement membrane, several atypical figures, and mitotic figures are present. So I mentioned that, that we should not rely on. on uh, uh, when making the diagnosis of carcinoma in situ, you see the lesions through the full thickness of the urothelium. For instance, here uh, I would like to call you and, and uh, show several examples of thin uh, in situ type, uh, different examples of carcinoma in situ here. I'm illustrating so called thin uh, form of uh, urothelial CIS. Here, uh, discohesive or clinging uh, carcinoma in situ. You see urothelial carcinoma in situ with pagetoid spread arising um, in the setting of squamous metaplasia of the ethelium. 
and uh, the role of immunohistochemistry is relatively limited. If one is compelled to make the diagnosis, one can attempt to use P53 and cytokeratin 20, which is treated in the right hand panel and full thickness. Um, uh, would support this diagnosis. Note that cytokeratin 20 is only positive in the superficial umbrella cells. I caution, however, that you do not need immunohistochemistry, and you need it usually doesn't work. Default is your morphology, and uh, negativity on immunohistochemistry or dubious result on immunohistochemistry should not be taken uh, as a definitive evidence of a lack of neoplastic change. Epithelial neoplasms with inverted or endophytic growth, uh, I should mention that Pulmonary um, and inverted growth can coexist. And, um, remember that some upper urinary tract urothelial cancers are associated with uh, hereditary non poses colorectal cancer, HNPCC syndrome or Lynch syndrome. Uh, these tumors with microsatellite instability have different clinical and histopathologic features. They of low stage, low grade, and demonstrate inverted growth and uh, higher prevalence in uh, female patients. The epitic good type lesions start from inverted urothelial papilloma and follow the same sequence for the lesions with inverted uh, urothelial neoplasm of low malignant potential, inverted grade, and inverted high grade uh, carcinoma with and without invasion. The next panel illustrates a typical inverted urothelial papilloma with in an organized fashion, usually circumscribed with uh, sometimes presence of uh, luminal um, orthic changes with uh, proteus material, with a little bit more stroma, where they can demonstrate uh, uh, a basal uh, distribution of the cells or nuclear streaming. These are the different morphologic phases of urothelial papilloma. In papilloma. Uh, left hand panel, one can be completely confident in dealing with uh, a intiturothelial papilloma, flat surface, trabecular growth, compact growth. But what about the uh, picture on the right? Uh, particularly if uh, such an area is present in a lesion that overwhelmingly looks inverted papilloma. So we're confident that it's last we can label as inverted papilloma, but what's on the right, we can actually label as inverted. It, urothelial neoplasm of low malignant potential. And this is, isn't, this is not well described in the literature, but, but I use it in those rare instances where I see uh, bodent and more, more tensile trabeculae that I can't reconcile with the typical uh, morphology on inverted papilloma, usually in areas with focal confluent growth and minimal atypia. Uh, inverted low grade urothelial carcinoma demonstrates inverted uh, growth with. In architectural order without evidence usually of invasion, and uh, inverted high grade urothelial carcinoma can be either non invasive and the same morphologic criteria apply to the as, uh, to inverted lesion as to the population, oh. and they can be either non invasive or they, they can be invasive. Uh, so here is a, a lesion that demonstrates inverted growth and higher magnification. You can see an invasive uh, component of this neoplasm. So inverted high grade urothelial carcinoma with Asia. Uh, I to also mention several variants uh, that you need always sort of keep in the back of my mind, of your mind when you're making a diagnosis, the diagnosis of nested micropapillary or small cell neuroendocrine cancer. A nested variant of urothelial carcinoma is characterized by small, it's composed of relatively bland cells, uh, which demonstrate uh, invasive growth. They look like von Brun's nests, but the cellular distribution and uh, the invasion in particular in the muscular is propria uh, can be uh, quite surprising when sees a lesion like this or a neoplasm like this for the first time. They're very aggressive neoplasms and one always a uh, variant of urothelial carcinoma in the differential diagnosis of unusual proliferative change lamina propria. Illustrating micropapillary variant of urothelial carcinoma on the left uh, uh, 
in the left you can see the filigree pattern without fibrovascular cores and on the right you can see the nest and the tubules floating in lacune and i should also mention that micropapillary carcinoma can be either uh, pure mixed with urothelial carcinoma here is an example in the blur which demonstrates extensive invasive growth without much going on on the surface and this is quite deep and the characterized with frequent vascular invasion and these types of carcinomas are also very uh, aggressive um, sees metastatic micropapillary carcinoma micropapillary urothelial carcinoma should always be included in the differential diagnosis in the odd possibilities should be ruled out, such as uh, primaries from the ovary, lung, breast, pancreas, and salivary gland carcinoma. Uh, small cell carcinoma is also important to recognize, albeit it's a little bit less commonly represented in the upper urinary tract. Uh, this is um, a that essentially resembles other small cell carcinomas at other sites and be also pure mixed. Regardless, the presence of neuroendocrine component should always be noted. The report was these patients are treated based on cisplatinum uh, type protocols. In terms of classification of uh, uh, the renal uh, tumors, the, the, the urinal and renal pelvis tumors, we use the PP classification or the uh, TM classification um, from uh, uh, situations that uh, arise with the primary tumor that can be assessed. There is no evidence of primary tumor to non invasive for flat carcinoma in situ. The invasion can be into subepithelial connective tissue or macular is propria, and there are differences in the PT3 stage for those carcinomas arising in the renal pelvis and ureter. In the pelvis, the tumor typically invades beyond muscularis into the peripelvic fat or renal parenchyma, and in ureter, the tumor invades beyond muscularis into periureteric fat. Uh, the designation T refers to the primary tumor that has not been previously treated, and the symbol P refers to the pathologic classification, as opposed to the clinical classification. Um, it is based on gross and microscopic examination. Uh, P entails a resection of the primary tumor or biopsy, which is adequate to evaluate the highest PT category, and then the N entails the removal of the nodes adequate to validate lymph node status, and PM implies microscopic examination of distant lesion. A classification is usually carried out by the treating physician before the treatment during the evaluation of the patient or in case when uh, the pathologic classification is not possible. Uh, pathologic staging is usually performed after the surgical resection of the primary tumor. And it depends on pathologic documentation of the anatomic extent of the disease, whether or not the primary tumor has been completely removed. But uh, as note, if a biopsy tumor is not resected for any reason, for instance, if it's um, completely unfeasible, uh, in highest T and, M, uh, T and N categories, and, or in, uh, one category of the tumor can be confirmed microscopically, the criteria for pathologic examination and staging has been sat satisfied, and one does not need a complete removal of the primary cancer. In terms of um, additional findings that can be reported, they pertain to inflammatory changes or to therapy related changes, cautery artifact, and similar other similar uh, features. Here, the picture schematically represents uh, uh, iteration of the T1 and T2. And uh, only PT1 and T2 invasion can be established on biopsy. And I've used here an example from a blood tumor. And this is the same for the tumors of the ureter and the renal pelvis. P3 tumor invasion into peripelvic fat cannot be uh, established on biopsy. Uh, the depth of invasion and stage in the pathologic stage actually are the most important prognostic factors for the patient with neoplasms of the upper urinary tract. Uh, the critical role of the surgical pathologist is to diagnose the depth and the extent of invasion. And the patterns of invasion are similar to those seen in the urinary bladder, uh, with one exception. 
uh, both uh, uh, important to note that lamina propria is, is absent beneath the urothelium or the renal uh, papillae or in the pelvis, and it's quite thin along the minor calyces. Urinary bladder and papillary tumors invasion occurs at the base of the tumor and frequently in the stalk of the tumor. But then filtrating the lamina propria is PT1, similar to the urinary bladder. Uh, there's no accepted approach for assessing the depth of lamina propria, although there are many uh, proposals in the literature. Uh, pathologists are encouraged to provide some uh, sort of assessment as to the extent of the lamina propria invasion. For instance, one can use focal versus extensive or report the uh, depth of invasion in millimeters, or one can um, report the level above, at, or below muscularis mucosi. Then if a tumor is merely muscle invasive is inappropriate, type of tumor muscle invasion such as muscularis mucosa, which is PT1 versus muscularis propria, PT2, need to clearly state it. If a uh, such as urothelial carcinoma with muscle invasion, indeterminate for type of muscle invasion may be used in those circumstances when it's possible to be certain whether the type of muscle uh, is muscularis propria or muscularis mucosa. For a renal pelvic tumors in situ extension of carcinoma into the renal collecting ducts and renal tubules does affect stage, and carcinomas invading into the renal parenchyma into the actual parenchyma are considered PT3. Renal carcinoma that invades through the kidney into the perinephric fat is PT4. Base upper tract urothelial carcinoma often present at higher stage. Um, to patients with urinary bladder carcinoma. Just to review the criteria for diagnosis of invasion into lamina propria, because this is a question that uh, uh, is often uh, faced almost daily. One should look at the invading epithelium and the stromal response. In terms of the invading epithelium, one can see uh, single cell infiltration, uh, finger like projection irregular nests, absent basement membrane, or invasive component, which is morphologically different. On the other hand, the stromal response is composed of retraction artifact, or invasion, or plasia or sclerosis, presence of myxoid stroma, and abstromal response. Let's trade this in the next several uh, pictures. The epithelium can either present, project as single cell or finger like projections, as illustrated on the image on the left, or an irregular nest of variable size, which are trading into the uh, superficial lamina propria with a loss of the basement membrane. Invasion can often uh, um, uh, demonstrate invasion component, which uh, shows different morphology. And here, for instance, on the panel, uh, on the right panel, one can see squamous differentiation. Retractive fact should not be misconstrued as uh, limb vascular invasion, and this often stromal response uh, uh, due to invasive urothelial carcinoma. Invasion can also be part of the stromal response, and desmoplasia or presence of spindle cells can also uh, be stromal part of the uh, spectrum of the stromal response to invasion. And finally, myxoid stroma can often been seen in these forms of invasion. Uh, in terms of the uh, ureter and pelvic biopsy, the CAB protocol also um, allows um, use descriptors uh, for multiple tumors, recurrent tumors, or tumors occurring post-treatment. Uh, the next image uh, illustrates a growth specimen with multiple uh, arterial tumors throughout the renal pelvis and minor cases, and these should be appropriately uh, designated with uh, uh, the Ripter M, uh, should be separately sampled and separately reported. The rest of uh, discussion, because there's uh, quite a bit of repetition, I wanted to use this introduction uh, because it pertains to all the other types of specimens of the renal pelvis and uh, ureter as well as will focus my comments only on the additional data fields that are present in these uh, uh, protocols. Humorize is one of the elements that one cannot uh, take precisely on uh, biopsy specimen, but in a lot 
specimens such as uh, uh, section of the ureter or um, uh, renal pelvis one can measure the greatest dimension as well as additional dimension or it can uh, state it cannot be determined uh, in a note or in a comment. The should also be denoted in terms of uh, whether they are uninvolved, uninvolved by invasive carcinoma, uh, how far the invasive or non-invasive carcinoma extends to the margin in, in addition to their location, and as well uh, whether there is carcinoma in situ at the or not. Uh, may include um, the rear or, or hilar soft tissue margin, uh, cuff, Lateral renal parenchymal margin or even uh, garota fascia margins, uh, depending on the type of the treatment. One should always um, read presence of limb vascular invasion because, um, in addition to the stage, limb vascular invasion is one of the most important prognostic factors and it can be either not identified, present, or indeterminate. Uh, when making the diagnosis of limb vascular invasion, should um, uh, use a certain criteria, although you know sometimes this uh, can be quite difficult. A tight a, and compact uh, cluster of urethral cells, usually you know, forming to the shape of the vessel or having a hard shell at the periphery with then a sort of presence of uh, uh, ribbles in a vessel or in multiple vessels can be definitely used as as definitive criteria. And one can also use um, um, some additional markers such as endothelial markers, um, D240 or factor A for endothelial or CD31 for um, uh, vascular invasion, but this is not, not always necessary. Uh, important to report in vascular invasion because there is high correlation between presence of vascular invasion and presence of nodal nets in native specimen, and definitely these uh, patients need to be met. Uh, maybe more aggressive. We mostly, when dealing with renal pelvis, um, particularly in the area of the renal cell, one should recognize that the thickness and the amount of muscular is propria is variable. As stated here, on the other hand, you don't have any sub epithelial tissue or muscular is propria on the epithelium or the papilla, and tumor aiding into the renal pelvis immediately goes into a high stage, PT3 stage. Let's uh, show you a few examples of these types of tumors. Um, here I have uh, um, a picture of a, a tumor which fits uh, on a slide completely, and here is the pathology of the of, the, of that same uh, picture at uh, low magnification. Um, Urethral carcinoma of the renal pelvis, again, non invasive, as illustrated here, but note the thinness of the subepithelial tissue, the muscular is propria and the proximity of the adjacent uh, uh, pelvic fat. An example of non-invasive PTA carcinoma of the renal pelvis. Uh, when evaluate the possibility of invasive, even at low magnification, one should also, also pay attention to difficulties in the morphology, such as irregular outlines or presence of inflammation, as we have noted previously. For instance, here, uh, the... Um, that I have designated with an A is shown on the right panel at higher magnification, and you can clearly see a superficial invasion to a subepithelial connective tissue which, uh, with few individual cells and uh, aberrant squamous, squamous differentiation, which is present here. And all these features are sufficient to establish a diagnosis of PT1 tumor even into subepithelial trauma. Uh, carcinoma invading into the renal pelvis due to positive or a lack of, uh, say correctly, uh, subepithelial tissue and muscular is probably immediately jumps into PT3 category. We should see a true invasion into the renal parenchyma. One often sees a situation such as this, when urothelial carcinoma simply grows into the directing duct tubu uh, tubules or the tubules without the evidence of invasion. And this is a situation of so-called in situ extension into renal collecting ducts and renal tubules, and this does not affect the stage itself. In terms of the PN and PM categories, those are the ones 
that are uh, previously uh, contained in the TNM classification, whether there is even into one uh, single node, two centimeters or less, uh, other node or multiple lymph nodes in PN2, but not more than five centimeters, or more than five centimeters with P3. Uh, regional lymph nodes are not always submitted or identified in cases of resection, but evaluation of these nodes is important. And we submit at least one section from each grossly positive lymph node, and all other lymph nodes should be entirely submitted as presence of nodal disease, maybe as an uh, indication for adjuvant therapy. In the distant METs, when uh, a last iteration of the TNM classification um, has emphasized the fact that uh, this is not applicable to the pathologist and uh, we should not include it uh, routinely as PMX, but included as PM1 is the, if distant metastasis is known to exist at the time of uh, the sign out. The ureter, I just want to repeat that, that all the elements that we've previously discussed, such as the laterality, the size, the type, the histologic grades, uh, the tumor configuration, the mass and lymph vascular invasion should also be reported. And in terms of the um, uh, tumor uh, classification, I outlined the stages uh, which are uh, similar with the exception of PT3 as those for the renal test. And I'd like to illustrate this with examples. Uh, this is uh, uh, illustrated whether it's confined within the epithelium, subepithelial connective tissue, or invasion into muscular is propria, and PT3 pertains to those tumor uh, invading into the periureteral fat. In an, uh, as previously mentioned, uh, one should uh, uh, use TNM descriptors if deal if one with multiple recurrent or post-treatment tumors. And there's also this category of residual tumor, or R. And if they are uh, remaining in the patient after the therapy with curative intent, um, uh, it's uncertain, previously was uncertain how to deal with this situation. Now it is characterized by this system uh, through the air classification. Uh, this is important because for the surgeon, the air classification may be useful to indicate the known or assumed status of the completeness of the surgical excision. And for the pathologist, the air classification is onto the status of the margins at a cell specimen and can be either R1 or R2, microscopic or macroscopic residual tumor. Uh, tumor involving the resection margin, the assumed to correspond to the residual tumor in the patient may be classified as R1 and as R2. For examples of urothelial carcinomas of the ureter that demonstrate gross papillae or nuclear or more solid appearance, these are, for instance, solitary tumors, but also note that in some instances you have multiple tumors or confluent involvement which would complete the fraction of the ureteral lumen. Uh, ureter is represented on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. I've illustrated um, uh, celial dysplasia seen here at mid-magnification and high magnification. One can appreciate the deep cytologic and architectural atypia. Uh, and uh, this is not part of the uh, application system, the TNM system. Um, in the, in some flat carcinoma in situ is illustrated on the left-hand panel, and P1 tumor uh, invading into subepithelial connective tissue is illustrated on the inch on the right. P tumor is tumor that invades into muscular is propria, and uh, irregular growth into muscular is propria in different sort of uh, shapes or forms, single cells, nest or cone growth indicates invasion into uh, muscular is propria. It also invades into periuric fats, and this is uh, PT division. And here I've illustrated a rare example of um, a small cell or neuroendocrine carcinoma that has extended all the way to uh, the ural margin. Uh, it also include other pathologic findings in addition to the tumor itself. As well as findings in the non neoplastic kidney, which pathologists often forget to mention. Uh, sometimes there is simply insufficient tissue because partial nephrectomy specimen is submitted with minimum amount of adjacent non neoplastic uh, kidney. And, uh, 
significant pathological alteration that should be mentioned in the report pertain to, to liver disease, tubular uh, or tubular intestinal disease, and vascular disease. Uh, for instance, arterial nephrosclerosis or hypertensive nephropathy and diabetic nephropathy are seen in approximately 20% of cases. In medical renal diseases can be seen such as thrombotic microangiopathy, HGF, IgA nephropathy. In particular, um, findings of greater than 20% of global glomerular sclerosis or advanced diabetic glomerular sclerosis is predictive of significant decline of renal function in a short period, for instance, six months. Uh, this may be often difficult for non specialist or uh, non renal pathologists to evaluate. And with respect that uh, one deals with medical renal disease, at least one should try to, to uh, perform a special stains, which would help with the diagnosis, such as yes, in Jones methanum in silver. And at least. Uh, um, uh, a consideration should be given to a consultation with a nephropathologist, which we per pursue if, if, if it's necessary. Uh, illustrating, for instance, the typical examples of that nephropathy with chemical Wilson or KW nodules, uh, which are uh, silver uh, positive and demonstrate mesial lamellation. On the right, uh, uh, I'm illustrating hypertensive vascular disease with. with uh, um, I can degree of fibrointimal thickening as well as arterial uh, diffuse hyalinosis or thickening of the wall of the arterial knee is characterized by extensive uh, global glomerulosclerosis and should also be included in the report, particularly if extensive tumors and in the renal test, for instance. In terms of sections necessary uh, uh, the mean, all the heteroscopic biopsies as well as needle core biopsies should be completely sampled. And if one deals with segmental ureterectomy with a tumor, for instance, in the proximal or mid ureter, length and the diameter of the intact ureter should be recorded and uh, be a gross search for a mass by, by palpation and visual inspection. And um, the proximal and the distal cross section margin should be. Be, and the other aspect of the ureter should be inked and there should be opened longitudinally and assessed for mucosal abnormalities. Um, after overnight fixation, in 10% uh, buffer formalin sections should be taken to demonstrate uh, deepest invasion. This is often not easy to assess, and that's why serial sections uh, should be uh, performed, and at least one section of the uninvolved ureter should be submitted. Uh, as an example of the ureter, ureter carcinoma, the ureter, eating the distal ureter, and you can see multiple serial sections of the ureter uh, illustrated here at the image on the right at high magnification. And you can see that it is often difficult to evaluate how deep the invasion or whether there is invasion. So, in this kind of circumstances, it's always uh, better to submit uh, uh, ureters. Radical nephroureterectomy specimen, uh, which are submitted with the bladder cuff, it's important to document the relationship of the tumor to some structures, including the renal parenchyma, the peripelvic fat, the soft tissue, and the ureter, and as well sections of the grossly unremarkable kidney, pelvis, and ureter should be obtained. And urothelial margins are the margins of the urinary bladder cuff, and they sample the sheave sections particularly if the tumor appears away. However, if the uh, uh, tumor is at the uh, uh, junction between the ureter and uh, the inner repair, uh, it's probably better to submit longitudinal sections to the presence or absence of invasive carcinoma and carcinoma in situ at this uh, uh, location. We just uh, fill in the blanks uh, for those uh, elements that pertain specifically to the urethra, and as well applies to the invasive and in situ carcinomas and associated epithelial lesions of the urethra. And, uh, separate uh, protocols, one pertaining to and one pertaining to the partial or total urethrectomy. Urethra can be removed to get cystectomy, cystoprostatectomy, or 
even with the more complex uh, um, process such as anterior exanteration. Changes that I've spoken previously in terms of the description of the original nodes pertains to uh, the lymph nodes resected urethral specimens. I don't uh, repeat this because it's the same as for the specimens of the ureter and the renal pelvis. Um, a few hints uh, of male and the female urethra. The male urethra is about 15 to 20 centimeters long, typically uh, considered to be composed of three or four uh, certain segments. The first is prostatic urethra extending from the bladder neck to the apex, then the membranous or bulbar urethra. Some this is referred to as bulbomerinous urethra, and then there is dull or penile urethra. On the other uh, female urethra is uh, much shorter, about four to five centimeters, and extends from the external urethral to the uh, internal urethral sphincter. And is presence of smooth muscle in the upper third, usually uh, referred to as posterior or uh, proximal urethra, and a skeletal muscle in the distal, in addition to smooth muscle in the distal uh, part of the urethra. As the lining is different, uh, that, uh, the distal portion of the urethra is lined by squamous epithelium, and the upper uh, proximal portion of the urethra is uh, aligned by urothelium. Uh, Epithelial tumors are four times more frequent in women than men. Well, urethral uh, and hiatus tumor are typically squamous cell carcinomas, and about 20% of all of the urethral tumors are squamous cell carcinomas. Proximal urethral tumors are urothelial, about 20%, and also adenocarcinomas. Um, in the site, one uh, has the option of including uh, the sites known. For the female urethra, it's referred as anterior and posterior. Uh, obviously, a relevant clinical history is important for the interpretation of the urethral biopsies and the history of uh, stones, re uh, renal stones or bladder stones, recent procedures, infections, obstructions, or therapeutic uh, treatments uh, leads to reactive epithelial changes and potentially can mimic malignancy. Neoplasms previously diagnosed should also be specified, including the type, site, and I've mentioned previously in terms of the histologic types that carcinomas of the urethra vary in histologic types, depending on the type of the epithelium in a given uh, location. In as you mentioned, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common type, about 70-75%, most commonly seen in the anterior or distal third of the urethra. And it is followed by urothelial and adenocarcinoma. Uh, there are several types of carcinomas that are particularly um, critical and that typically occur at this location, such as clear cell adenocarcinoma, which may comprise a significant portion of adenocarcinomas, in, which is quite rare in men. Adenomas of the male urethra are squamous cell carcinomas, followed by urothelial carcinomas, and in women, the urothelial carcinomas are typically more proximal. Uh, urethral adenocarcinomas also, uh, are also quite rare, in, and I should mention that adenocarcinomas may rarely arise from periurethral glands known as skinous glands in female or litrous glands in male uh, periurethral uh, patients. The relation between urothelial carcinoma with aberrant squamous or glandular differentiation at a primary soma or carcinoma can be difficult and sometimes very arbitrary, but as I mentioned previously, most authorities would require pure, almost pure histology of squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma to detonate a tumor as such. Um, here is uh, an image that, that I think presents a tectomy specimen, however, take my word. In the portion, this is a female urethra. I've used this gross image to illustrate the uh, close appearance of an ulcerating cell carcinoma, which was deeply invasive, although not very apparent on uh, the surface. Here, an example of a gross image of carcinoma of the distal multinile urethra, which invaded deeply into the corpus sposum.
genoma of the U3 tri are no different from those rising elsewhere. And here on the left, you can see an example of native carcinoma. And on the right, I'm illustrating an invasive carcinoma, which also follows the same um, classification, well, moderately or poorly differentiated. Uh, I mentioned that there is frequent association with chronic HPV infection, and there is high risk for HPV 16 and 18 uh, types, which are detected in about 60% of urethral carcinomas or women, and, and both of that about 30% in men. Another example of a rare type of uh, carcinoma that can be seen in the distal penile urethra, this is a so-called verruca carcinoma, which is a non-invasive Carcinoma uh, that really occurs in the urethra. Uh, in terms of the primary adenocarcinomas, about 60% of those arising in the urethra are of nonlinear cell morphology and they can be identetic, seen as sig signet ring or NOS, as illustrated here. Although we can argue that potentially, you know, this can be uh, uh, labeled as endometrioid or endometrioid like with small initials. Some of these carcinomas, adenocarcinomas, may arise for metaplastic changes from periuteral glands as well, um, uh, from sinus glands, uh, from literal glands, or from Cowper's glands in men. And female periurethral gland carcinomas are, are typically uh, uh, cell and mucinous and often show, uh, one should uh, keep in the back of the mind, PSA, immunosuppression, uh, immunoexpression can be positive even from racemase. Uh, here's an example of mucinous or colloid adenocarcinoma, a rare type of carcinoma that can be seen in the urethra. And here is an example of signetring adenocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma that demonstrates uh, mucinous and signetring features. Here is an example of clear cell adenocarcinoma, a rare variant of clear cell uh, carcinoma seen in the urethra. And, uh, uh, in addition to the clearing, one usually sees either solid or papillary growth and PAS positivity. Um, but there are types of clear adenocarcinomas uh, that can look uh, like this, uh, demonstrating primarily tubular cystic. Um, they consider to arise from either mullein rests or urothelial metaplastic areas, and also arise in urethral diverticula. They're almost exclusive in female, exceptionally rare in men, and one needs to see evidence of invasion with hemorrhage and necrosis to make this diagnosis. But sometimes the differential di diagnosis from a nephrogenic adenoma or metaplasia can be quite uh, and difficult, and one should pay attention not to make a mistake and overcall these as nephrogenic adenoma because the presence of cell atypia and mitosis, as well as presence of high KI67 proliferation rate and P53 positivity can be used as evidence of cell adenocarcinoma. Here's an example of condoma cuminatum, which is a non-neoplastic lesion that can be seen in the urethra. And here's an example of urethral polyp of static type because the poids and papillatures are aligned by a prostatic epithelium. In uh, uh, urethra, I've uh, outlined that, you know, different procedures can be uh, performed and all of those elements that we, we talked previously pertaining to the ureter and renal pelvis also pertain to those in the uh, protocol for urethra, uh, tumor size and the size, histologic type, associated epithelial lesion, histologic grade and the tumor configuration, which can be either uh, solid, nodular, flat and ulcerated. I'd like to illustrate in the next little while with uh, with a series of images and to conclude the presentation with examples of um, uh, the staging system that pertains to the urethra. Obviously, when microscopic tumor extension is best, we have different um, uh, in terms of the depth and extent of invasion, and the margins should all be reported. I uh, um, know the um, uh, that so you know sometimes it's not possible, and uh, in these uh, parts of the protocols, at this occasion one can specify as well if the specimen is received unoriented, which is uh, more often than not the case, which precludes identification of the margins. 
uh, in uh, the inversion can be uh, a different level, and I'd like to use um, the level images to illustrate uh, these uh, different uh, stages. Old uh, them that I've used on these images from the old uh, atlas from the edition and you can see that the depth of invasion can span from the epithelium to the subepithelial connective tissue, uteral muscle, corpus callosum or corpus cavernosum. Or corpus cavernosum. Uh, the separate staging from the tumor for the tumor involving uh, the prostic urethra. Please note that there is um, there are two options in uh, ignating inside tumors, which can either arise uh, from the prostatic urethra or from the prostatic ducts, as well as uh, tumors that invade the subepithelial connective tissue, but this only pertains to the tumor invading from the urethral lumen. All these uh, are applicable to body specimens except uh, the PT4 stage, which cannot be designated on body when the invasion involves adjacent organs. Here, a diagram showing Ashinoma of the prostatic urethra and PT1 tumors, I should emphasize again, only pertains to tumoring from the urethral lumen. Here you see a superficial tumor, tumor of the urethra invading into the uh, superficial lamina propria with focal intraductal spread. One SPD is carcinoma in situ involving the prostatic ducts. Uh, PT4 invading. Invading invasion from the ducts or can be continuous from the uh, invade through the subepithelial tissue. And this um, change from the previous uh, iterations of the TNM classification, uh, PT1 uh, only applies to tumors invading from the urethral lumen. PT2 tumors, regardless which uh, route it takes, it's always into the stroma, invading into the stroma, it's always considered PT2. Here, Asian uh, prostatic ducts, carcinoma uh, in, uh, growing into the prostatic ducts, and this PT2 tumor invading the prostatic stroma um, on the left hand panel and uh, on the right panel. It can be seen uh, in the superior or the upper portion of the image. Most of these are demonstrating uh, intraductal spread. PT tumors, uh, those that invade beyond prostatic capsule in the bladder neck or the Extra prostatic extension or PT4 tumors invade adjacent organs such as bladder or seminal vesicle. Um, here you can see invasion beyond prostatic capsule into uh, the periprostatic uh, adipose tissue, and you can see PT4 tumor invading seminal vesicle, surrounding the seminal vesicle. Here is the small seminal vesicle epithelium. Here is an invasive nest of uh, urethral carcinoma. In terms of the PN and PM classification, again, there are no just, and one should denote whether there is an into a single or uh, note more less or more than two centimeters or in multiple nodes. And again, the same um, principles apply when dealing with the PM classification, which we've uh, spoken about previously. And in the last few slides, just to say a few words about protections of microscopic evaluation of the urethra. In transurethral statements, one should submit one section per centimeter of tumor, up to 10 cassettes, but always, you know, if the tumor is non-invasive by the initial sampling, additional sections should be included, probably submitting all the tissue that's available. If there is urethrectomy specimen, uh, one submit at least one section per centimeter of tumor, including the, the areas of macroscopic deepest penetration, and it is necessary to document uh, the relationship of the tumor to the surrounding anatomic, which is critical for proper margin. Uh, in terms of the margins, uh, distal and proximal urethral margins should be also submitted unless they are evaluated intraoperatively by protection. And these margins typically are submitted and fast in order to see the, the complete arterial lining. But if the tumor is in close proximity to the margin, one resort to to performing perpendicular sections, which show the relationship uh, of invasive and nitro carcinoma uh, to ink. Around the radial soft tissue margins should also be submitted.
transmitted will be guided by the closest approximation of the tumor to the ink by which evaluation. In terms of the nodes, one should submit the previously mentioned at least one section from each uh, grossly positive nodes, but the size, because it's relevant for the uh, end staging, should be recorded. And uh, particularly, if only representative sections are submitted, that count for the largest dimension. So this should be during the gross examination. All the lymph nodes should be entirely submitted, as presence of nodal disease may be used, as we previously, as an indication for adjuvant therapy. In the assessment of the other adjacent tissue, one should submit at least one or more sections of other organs, and if the tumor grossly appears, to invade the prostate, uterus, bladder, vagina section should also be targeted to these uh, areas to show the possible relationship of infiltrating the tumor and the adjacent viscous. One admit several sections of the urinary bladder mucosa away from the carcinoma, especially if it looks abnormal, including lateral walls, the dome, and the trigon, because as we all know, the urothelial neoplas neoplasm is frequently multifocal. One should also be submitted from the each ureteral margin if they are not separately submitted and evaluated by pro section. And as a representative section of prostatic peripheral zone, central zone, and seminal vesicles should be included because concomitant prostatic adenocarcinoma is not uncommon, typically seen in the setting of prostatic adenocarcinoma occurring uh, in conjunction with uh, urothelial carcinoma of the bladder, but also of the urethra. Here is an example of urethelial carcinoma with ductal spread and concomitant uh, static adenocarcinoma, and that sort of butting heads trying to prevail. But um, uh, I mentioned about 30 to 40 percent of instances uh, when one evaluates uh, bladder cancer, one will find, if diligently, in the prostate uh, in old men, presence of prostatic genome. And that I'd like to conclude my presentation, and I've included the slide which all of my colleagues seated around the microscope. Probably, you know, these cases are difficult, and uh, my last message to you is whenever you have a difficult case, share it with your colleagues and pick their collective wisdom, because that's how we uh, become biologists and safe pathologists. And that, I really from the bottom of my heart, happy to entertain any questions.